my name is Atli Orvason. I am a composer for film and television. And Kaya and I are going to hang out and chat. And um, actually, I don't know what he's going to talk about, but you know, we'll figure something out. Um, probably we're going to mention the Hitman's Bodyguard. Going to mention some other projects, but let's find out what he wants to know. <laughs> Atli, thank you so much for for uh, sitting down in your studio here. It's such a great honor to to do a video chat for once. Yeah, my pleasure, man. <laughs> So to start off, I know we've done some interviews in the past, but I'd like to kind of revisit your kind of your origin story, I guess. And, I, you know, talking about your, your childhood growing up in Iceland and kind of when did you start to discover that music was going to become, a, you know, part of your life and that's kind of what you wanted to pursue as a career? Hmm. Um, well, you know, when I look back, it's uh, there's just something, there's the, this sort of inevitability about music in my life. Uh you know, my dad was a musician, mm -hmm. and my mom is an amateur musician. You know, there's music, there's musicians in my on both sides of the family, really. And uh, all I know is that when I was about five, I went to my uncle's house with my grandfather, and you know, I think my grandfather mentioned something to to my my uncle who was a a church, um, like he he uh, he was a conductor for the church in town and. Mm -hmm. and taught organ and that kind of thing and he says you know I think the kids got some talent you know and 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 my uncle says well you know maybe I should give him a lesson you know all right that sounds good morning after at 10 o'clock I knock on his door it's like I'm here for my lesson <laughs> and I don't think he you know <laughs> thought it was that serious but yeah. apparently I was you know uh so you know and I mean I've been involved in music ever since you know I've tried to quit a couple of times <laughs> that failed miserably uh, the first time I, I went as an exchange student after high school in Iceland and um, you know I, w I went to Hungary and Austria and, and and that was one of those attempts to stop being a musician and after about a week or something I just ran to the nearest piano s store and uh -huh. sat down and started playing the piano you yeah know? so I don't know it's just um, it, it's just what I do right so at what point in your life did uh film kind of come into it and when you decided to go okay now film composing is a path that I can take and make a career out of it was it later in life or kind of early on uh you know I think sort of officially that happened while I was at Berkeley so in mm -hmm. my early 20s I went to Berkeley College of Music right. and uh didn't really know what I was there to do to be honest specifically other than you know obviously being in music um you know I was into jazz piano a little bit but I'd been classically trained and I'd also been playing jazz and I'd been playing rock and roll and pit orchestras and symphony orchestras like everything you know yeah. and so but you know I'd had a, a pretty big career for Icelandic standards at the time yeah. with rock and roll bands but I just I, it wasn't something about that wasn't quite right so while I'm at Berkeley I just sort of started thinking about what you know you know what the hell is my purpose <laughs> and uh but it was kind of a total coincidence that i i decided to just give this film scoring sort of introduction to film scoring um a chance it was just a course with right. that description i was like well let's try that let's see what that's like and i i thought sort of just reading the description of the course you know it's it's uh, composition orchestration computers some recording technology it seemed to combine a lot of things I was interested in mm. but the thing that obviously grabbed me was you know writing music to picture and um, I remember my first assignment I think it was about a 45 second main title might have been a minute right. it took me about three weeks to write it of <laughs> course uh, and but I, I just like I instantly knew when I finished it recorded it I was just like something happened and I was like this is what I want to do right so when you you know you graduated and you started to pursue that uh, part of you know that industry what was kind of the first job you had in the industry I mean you mentioned that you worked with Mike Post um, um, was that the first thing that came was Hans coming in well, when did that happen and how did that kind of kickstart your career there well um, you know, after Berkeley, I decided to go to graduate school for composition okay, right. in, at the University of North Carolina, um, actually film music. Uh -huh. uh, and at the time, I think it was one of maybe two 
master's degrees in film music composition in the country, wow. probably in the world. <laughs> yeah. uh, and I was just like, I, I you know, I, I, for some reason after Berkeley, I was like, I want to study more. I want to have, because I, I think there's something about having the time to mm. study, which is great, you know, and yeah. being able to just be out, out in North Carolina, you know, sort of out of the, you know, the out of, yeah, yeah, out of, well, yeah, just kind of out of the way in a way. And, yeah. and, um, so anyway, I was coming to the end of those studies, didn't really know what to do next. Yeah. And, uh, you know, my professor there, my mentor and dear friend, David McHugh, brings over this flyer from BMI and it's, um, it's to promote the, the Pete Carpenter Fellowship, which BMI uh, conducts. And at the time, it was it was Mike Post who was in charge of it. Right. And uh, basically, it's like, you know, send the demo and, you know, th one to three um, young composers will be chosen to come out to work with Mr. Post at his studio. And, uh, you know, long story short, I got in. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And yeah, I mean, and I just came out. There's like me and two other people chosen that year, uh, and um, you know, I was still just like fresh out of school, didn't yeah. know what to do. Right. Came out, uh, hung out with Mike for a while, and uh, he was incredibly gracious and generous, and and uh, and basically, I can pretty much trace every sort of string of of career advancement that I've had back to back to those few weeks with with Mike right and I mean you got to work on some of his shows NYPD, NYPD Blue and Dragnet and Law and Order and kind of is that is what would, would you say that was kind of almost like a training course for you to understand how the business worked as well and or was it more just kind of learning his process um, it was all of the above yeah you know I mean uh, first of all it's sort of like you know, obviously, I had had a master's degree in film music composition, but you really don't know much when you come out of school. Exactly. <laughs> you're in this little, I think, it, for me, I went to film school, so you're in this protective little bubble, yeah. and they pop it, and you're just like, what? Yeah. <laughs> you're kind of like, you no, know, deer I mean, in the headlights, like, what now? Absolutely. Right? I mean, you don't know how things work in the real life, real world. <laughs> no, you don't. And, uh, and ironically, some of the things you're taught are already outdated and yeah. things have changed technology has exactly. changed etc but no i would say i mean first of all you know i i got to work on thousands of hours of drama yeah which you know is obviously an incredible training just in learning the picture learning how the music works and all that um but yeah obviously you you sort of take in there's a bit of a osmosis going on you take in what mike is doing with his you know the people he's working with and the business and all that right and uh and that you know obviously continued on when i when i um moved to remote control and started working with hans zimmer you know it's like you know you sit next to these people who are sort of you know one is at the top of the tv pyramid and the other one's at the top of the film pyramid right and i mean if you don't learn something there's something wrong <laughs> you know <laughs> Um, so yeah, when did how did you meet Hans and how did you end up? I mean, we're sitting here remote control. Your studio has been here for I mean, you've been here for a while, and and most of your career kind of grew out of this room, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, obviously it's all like the root probably is up in Burbank at Mike's studio, right? And uh, you know, and this is one of the branches. You know, yeah. I mean, it, it's like careers are long and they're complicated and they're sort of it's kind of like this. Yeah, I mean, a tree is not a bad metaphor for it. Yeah. you know. But um, actually, um, I met Hans through our mutual agent, Sam Schwartz. Mm, right. And Sam and, you know, Mike Post are very good friends. And, and in fact, um, a little story is when I got married in 2005, uh, we all went to Iceland on my bachelor party, me, Mike Post, Mike Gorfing, Sam Schwartz, and some other people. <laughs> and so we all got to be quite close and, awesome. and it was really awesome yeah and um, and then uh, you know Sam sort of you know after I graduated from Mike's stable um, you know I was, when I was while I was working for him I got the opportunity to do Stuart Little 3 right that was yeah which was great I mean and uh, you know I met somebody through Mike who was producing that film and and um you know, she was looking for a composer, you know, it was 
directed DVD. Sylvester obviously wasn't going to do it. Right. They yeah. needed a young, cheap composer. <laughs> you know, and I'm like, <laughs> uh, so I, I wrote a demo. You yeah. know, and I sent it to her, and they really liked it, and somehow I got the gig. And then, you know, I re I remember having this realization. I I had to, I was at um, in Palm Springs for a weekend, you know, with my wife and some friends, and I was like, it was right after I got the gig, but before I started working on it. And yeah. I, I I brought along, you know, Alan Silvestri's scores for Stuart Little and Stuart Little Two. Yeah, and I just remember having this terrifying realization <laughs> listening to this music that I had no idea what I was doing <laughs> and and but you know I mean it was a really good sort of you just jump in the deep end of the pool and and sink or swim yeah and <laughs> swim, swim yeah. so uh, but anyways Mike graciously gave me some gave me a sabbatical to go and do that and then you know after that was done he was basically you know it's time for you to leave the nest and and I I did and I did some jobs here and there and, and then Sam had this idea that I should meet Hans yeah. and um, I think his words exactly were you'll fit right in with the rest of the Euro trash down there <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and apparently I did yeah. and, you know I'm still here uh, yeah. you know what has it been now 10 years 11 wow. years yeah and uh, yeah I mean John Baker early project you mentioned Stuart a little but another one of your early films that I uh, really loved was The Last Confederate mm -hmm. and, and I thought that was uh, that kind of brought my attention I think to your work and and, and how was that interesting yeah, it's most an interesting scoring an American Civil War drama yeah you know for an Icelandic composer early in their career I mean do you remember that film and kind of the approach yeah. you took on that one yeah I mean I actually it's interesting because the the guy who produced the film wrote it and it's sort of based on his great 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 grandfather's yeah, story the family's, yeah. Yeah, state, yeah you know he he made an interesting point. He was like, you know, he said, I'm actually glad that you're not from this country because then you don't have a bias. Right. You know, you're not pro-Confederate or pro, you know, Northerners or whatever. You know, it's like, yeah. there's just a, for me, it was kind of a clean slate. And, right. And I mean, I thought, you know, for me, I, I just kind of went to, I tried to go back to the roots of the people who came over, you know, on the Mayflower or whatever. And, and it, I mean, it's sort of like, I tried to look at it from a historical perspective. And most of these people, you know, were at least the people this movie is about were originally from Scotland or Ireland or the UK. And uh, I figured, you know, some sort of Celticness would probably be yeah. appropriate, you know. And, uh, and then, I mean, I, I think just through osmosis, you know, as a composer, as a as a lover of music, you know, I mean, sort of that Americana sound that mm -hmm. maybe, you know, Leonard Bernstein and and you know those kinds of composers are right. famous for, um, you know, it just sort of seeps into what you do. Aaron Copland, obviously, yeah, of you course. know, even Dvorak, you know, I, yeah. I mean, his New World Symphony, I think, is is some of the best American music ever made, you know, <laughs> and uh, so. All the while you're kind of doing these films and kind of getting your feet wet and kind of creating, I guess, uh, your sound. I always ask composers, kind of, do you remember a point where you had to kind of look at yourself and kind of look at yourself in the mirror and go, "What is my sound going to be? Who does that ever come up? Like, oh, I want, I want to sound like this. This is my sound as a composer. I don't want to <laughs> sound like that person. I want my voice to be original or in kind of an auteur style. Does that ever like cross your mind in terms of building?" the scores that you work on is it, it, it or does that develop naturally just from the projects you work on like without even thinking about it subconsciously well i think it's probably different for everybody but mm -hmm. i mean i you know it's something that i've thought about a lot and i'm sure most composers do you know right. uh, i mean i happen to be a bit of a chameleon musically mm -hmm. because yeah. it's like i've i've touched on so many different styles of music and been in bands and and you know been sort of on on the legit side you know and and also a rock and roller and yeah. and and i think that um i i love writing all kinds of different you know styles of music you know and uh so maybe that makes it a bit tricky to find whatever your style or your identity is yeah but i think at the end of the day your identity is somehow um I mean, if you think about it, you know, if you write something, you know, uh, empty canvas, 
Yeah, and you have to basically sort of bare your soul and come yeah. up, come out, come up with you, something yeah. that is you. And I think, and I think that's at the end of the day. I mean, it's a vague answer, but I think right. it's really it's trying to just be honest and kind of come up with something from your core, within the framework and the context of the project and whatever music would fit in there. You know, I mean, right. Hitman's Bodyguard is kind of blues and rock and roll, and that goes back to sort of you know, my late teens and early 20s when I was playing in rock and roll bands. But I can draw on that, you know, experience. And yeah. it's it's still there. I can still play the Hammond B3 like I did back then. But then, you know, now I'm working on an animation film, which is full or fully orchestral and, and completely different, but also draws on my experience. So I, I feel like, you know, it, it's like completely different styles of music, different ensembles, different instruments, everything. But all I'm trying to do is, is, you know, open, open myself up and be honest and try to come up with something from the heart. You know? Right. And I, I'm gonna probably jump in chronological order here, but I want to talk and jump to Rams for a bit because just talking about you as a composer, that score resonated with me so deeply. For mm. and I, for some reason, I just felt like that was, it felt so personal and so intimate. And I think mm-hmm. it's my, probably my favorite score of yours. And I just wanted <laughs> okay. to talk about because i know it's it, there's a story it's an icelandic film and yeah and um what was it like working on that and kind of telling a story from from your country and and putting your kind of stamp on it uh it was amazing you know obviously yeah. i mean it was actually um uh, sort of a you know it was in what's the word that i'm looking for you know it, it was very intentional for me to go back home and, yeah. tr- and try to sort of uh, kind of connect with my roots or something. Because didn't, it, didn't you tell me it take pl- takes place in the village that uh, you either grew up or your father? I forget something you mentioned something about the location. Yeah, no, I mean, yeah. well, here's the story. So, <laughs> so you know, I have a great friend and um, agent in Paris, Jean-Pierre Key, mm-hmm. and we started working together right around that time. And, and you know, because I told him I was like, I'm interested in doing more sort of artistic right. movies and 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 or maybe just movies that will allow me to be a bit more honest musically and and kind of explore something that's a, you know it's not production music but yeah, it's yeah. actually music right. you know anyway um he's like well you know you know it might be difficult to for me to get you work because your label is Hollywood, you know, right. and I'm like, all right, well, let's give it a chance. So he's like, well, why don't you come to this, you know, film festival in the French Alps? And it was just before Christmas. Um, I don't, I can't remember which year it was, but anyway, I'm like, all right, let's do that. So I fly L.A., London, Geneva, and then I had to take a bus for two and a half hours to get to this <laughs> mountain, like ski town in the French Alps. You know, oh, wow. I was just like, what am I doing? You know, <laughs> uh, and. You know, it quickly revealed itself what I was doing there because I I, uh, I ran into this guy, and and the funny thing is like I ran into so many people from Iceland at that festival. Yeah. And the first person I meet is a guy called Grimar Jonsson, who produced Rams, and and we just you know we're just sitting at the bar having a drink and a chat, and he tells me about this film. He's like, you know, it's about these two brothers who live in a remote valley in Iceland, and. You know, and I said, well, you know, don't you need a place to shoot it? And he's like, no, no, we, uh, we've we scouted. We know exactly where we're going to shoot it. And he tells me the name of the farm. Uh-huh. And I'm just like, all right. That's where my mother was born. Right. You know, my, right. my grandfather was the farmer there. My mom was born in the farmhouse where they shot half the film. Wow. So, yeah, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> really to your roots. Yeah, yeah I'd say. <laughs> and then, um, you know. I, I said to Grima, basically, ah, well, I have to do the film. He's like, yeah, you know, I, um, I'll i talk to the director. And just as Jean-Pierre had predicted, yeah. it was a tough sell. Because, <laughs> I mean, he, you know, the director went online and found stuff that I'd done here. And right. was like, that couldn't be more wrong for my film. Right. So I don't think that's going to work. And <clears throat> But I wrote this long, long email to him. And I said, I just, you know, laid it all out. And it's like, yeah. you know, I'm from there. My mom was born there, you know my ancestors have lived in that valley you know or my family has lived there for you know hundreds of years yeah blah 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 and uh, you know somehow i was able to convince him he's like all right let's do it you know and um 
And we talked a long, you know, we talked a bunch about, you know, musical instruments, style, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, my thing was, I mean, because I, you know, my, my family, as I said, grew up there and it's like, I know that they gathered around the piano or the, mostly the organ mm -hmm. and played and earlier, you know, a few generations back, they wouldn't have the organ and there's somebody in my family played the violin and there's a couple of people who played the accordion. Right. Including my father, right. who's actually not from that valley, but still, uh, what happens is from the time I'm hired and until I make the music, my father passes away. Oh, wow. So to make it even more, you know, to my roots, I took his accordion, went to the church in the valley. Yeah. Because it's kind of like the only place where you can record music. Right. With a friend of mine and some microphones. And so two days before they started shooting the film, I just went there. Just on, a, on you know, sort of a fishing trip to see if, <laughs> if any music would come out of it. And I just hung out there for a day and came up with this theme on the accordion. And, and that became the theme of the film. Wow. So I was born, it was born in the space that the film takes place in that from your roots. That's Very much so. And yeah. what was cool about it, too, is that you know, the director would play this piece of music for the actors in the morning before they went out to, to you know, act out Sorry, the film. Yeah. And so I, I feel like, I mean, of all the work that I've done, it's clearly the sort of the, I mean, the music is the, probably the closest knit into the fabric of the film yeah. of, of any project I've ever done. That this, talking about, um, you know, how images are born for me and an image is born from listening to film music mm -hmm. and then for you as a, as a composer you're looking at the image and that's where the sound is coming from the music is coming from but i guess to ask you i always like to ask composers where does the first note come from for me like when you where do you look for the first little thing of inspiration is it just the, at the script i mean for rams was very obvious yeah um but for okay more on a general point do you look at the script do you look at the first cut of the film do you just sit with the director and talk and this where maybe that first idea the first little melody like where does it kind of come from well it, it can be any of any of the above you know yeah. um I, what i've learned from hans more than anybody is, is the idea that you know come up with an I a big idea a right. concept you know and it seems to me you know i'm no um brain specialist but it seems to me that if you give your creative brain a bit of information to go with it, it mm -hmm. helps you know so i mean go back to ramps you know yeah, we, yeah. we know okay it could be one of these four instruments you know and um so there's at least there's already sort of a, a like an intellectual framework or some something like a structure right of of things for the creative process to kind of be built upon. Mm -hmm. So I think that's really important. I think it's really important to think about, you know, history, geography, character, you know, what kind of instruments could have been there, et cetera. You right, know, yeah. just, just by doing that, just by thinking about it, you know, you, you, there's a framework, there's like, um, there's a, you know, there's a, a cradle for something to be, yeah. you know, born out of. And, uh, and that's, I mean, you know, and then you just hope to get lucky, you know, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, it's like, uh, then the rest, that's the part where you can't explain, I guess. Right? No. Yeah. And I mean, sometimes it takes forever and sometimes it's like the first thing you think about, you know, yeah. I mean, um, doing this animation film, uh, this Icelandic Belgian co-production called Ploey. And I mean, I wrote the theme for that in like five minutes mm -hmm. and I just, I like the way I experienced it, I didn't write it. It just like, it was just ready it yeah. just came out you know and i mean those it's hard to explain those moments yeah yeah for sure and, and then like right now i'm doing another project which is um a law and order mini series about the menendez murders right and uh that was really difficult for me to kind of figure out and like you know just again it, i really went into thinking about it and trying to sort of and i was listening to like you know that takes place in LA, so I started listening to some old noir music, and, yeah, and like, yeah. which obviously doesn't work verbatim, but you know right, you somehow right. have to like 
get the creative juices yeah, flowing, you know. Yeah, the atmosphere. Yeah. yeah, yeah, for sure. And and so, I don't know. I mean, I think it's like it's something you actually learn and get better at. It's mm-hmm. sort of that sort of, you know, fishing is a good word for it because you're just like throwing out all these hooks and like hoping, hoping that something <laughs> sticks somewhere, you know. <laughs> for sure. Um, and now rewinding a little bit back, kind of. Uh, to those Hollywood movies that almost didn't get you Rams. Um, you know, some of your uh, early films that uh, that I really liked, you know, kind of these studio action movies like Vantage Point, Babylon AD. Mm-hmm. Um, when you are writing action music, is there, is the, did you kind of crack the code of like, what is a good action score? Like, you know, there's so many compose. I mean, action is such a big genre. It's a big money-making genre in Hollywood. I mean, superhero movies, everything. But in your opinion, what makes a great, action score when you're working on these films like you have to compete with sound effects too you're looking for melodies i mean is there anything that you found any truths that you discovered well i mean i, I think that's kind of a, a consideration like sound mm-hmm. effects and obviously right. you know if you have a lot of sound effects you might want to try to stick with some long sustains rather than you know a bunch of drums yeah. you know <laughs> those kinds of things but right. really i mean that's I don't really think that's the main sort of um, consideration, you mm-hmm. know. Um, no, I can't say that I <laughs> have cracked it. I, I, all I know is that it's incredibly work-intensive and time-consuming. And uh, if there's anything I've learned, it's just about how to get it done for myself. Right. Is to when I was starting out, I was just I would sit down. And I was like, I'm gonna finish this four minute cue mm-hmm. before I get back up, you know, which is the worst possible thing you can do, because <laughs> the the thing really to do is just to write something, sketch something out, then go to something else, go home, go eat, go write another cue, anything, and then come back to it, and you'll discover things right away that you wouldn't if you just sit there and and you know hit your head against the wall. Right. So I mean. But, no, I mean, you know, I, I think all the principles we've talked about before kind of apply, you know. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Vantage Point, Spain, you know, terrorists from the Middle East, you know, American president. Right. It's like the, there's already kind of a picture forming of... Right. And then, you know, the, the job there really was to be inventive in the electronic realm, you know, and combine something very, very modern mm-hmm. with, you know, the rest of it. and. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I mean, I spent a lot of time working with synths and stuff in the 80s and 90s. But um, nevertheless, it was a really difficult thing for me to go back to that and and kind of... Or it was sort of like... Yeah, it it, it was sort of putting on an old shoe, but it, it was way too small or something. Yeah, I had yeah, to, like, you, you know, like it stretch it out, <laughs> you know? And, and that... But at the end of the day, it's also something really... Uh, it's just really kind of rewarding once you expand your comfort zone a bit, yeah. you know, and that's, that's really what it's about. I think, you know, just get out of that zone that's easy and safe and try something new. Right. And I, for, for action though, I think, um, and just talking with other composers, it's, you know, action films, you mentioned there's so many moving pieces because I mean, it's not just yeah, there's some long take kind of directors, but there's a lot of cuts, there's a lot of, and the edits are constantly changing, and that kind yeah. of, you know, it'll shorten this scene, and then maybe lengthen this scene, and yeah, that yeah, scene, yeah. and with all those different pieces moving, um, how do you adapt as a composer? Because I know, like, I just recently talked with Steve, who did Transformers, and mm-hmm. every time they shrink a scene, and, and, you know, if you change something here, that can affect something over here. I mean, how do you keep your scores, I guess, from... I guess from not from collapsing. If they if there's any changes in the edits, is there any experiences that you've had? I know Season of the Witch was one that went through a big change, and you had to come back and rescore twice. Twice. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, let's use that as an example of of yeah of making a score work as a whole. When of, I guess when a picture changes. Well, that I mean that one was literally almost sort of re. Um, defining the film and reinventing the score right. a couple of times, but I think what you're talking about is more sort of like structural, yeah, yeah. And, and just keeping up with with frame, you know, chops here Shades and there. Here, yeah, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> you know what? Interestingly, I find that very often I'll be kind of struggling to make the music work with a cut, mm. and then they go like, you know what? It's not right. We've recut it, and then it becomes really easy. No, okay. So. You know, I think very often 
when it's really hard to get the music to work, there's just something inherently wrong with the way the picture's cut. <laughs> On the other hand, you know, every now and then, like, for example, the main title for Hitman's Bodyguard, mm -hmm. you know, like, a couple of days before scoring, I learned, okay, we've added, you know, I don't know, 20 seconds of titles in front of your main title, and we cut a bunch of stuff, and I'm just right. like, oh no, it's <laughs> like, you know, it works perfectly as it is. Yeah. And then you just go in and you just keep, it's like, I think it's like sculpting or something, you know, yeah. you just keep like molding, it into, molding it into shape until it somehow works, and very often, you know, tempo is obviously key, you know, and yeah. it's like, but very often, I, I don't know, I, I think composition the mind of the composer so much of it is about letting go of your kind of you know I don't know falling in love with your own material right and just being able to go like alright whatever let's just change it you I know say that with editors as well like picture, yeah. you know you can't get fall in love with a scene because, no you know, if it's not serving the story it has yeah. to go you've got to learn how to learn to kill your darlings as they say yeah <laughs> um, and you know and if you just like let go of that then most of the time you know there's always a solution and uh, you and it's one of the things you just get better at I think yeah you know for sure. practice yeah well, let's jump back to the season of the witch then, which was a different <laughs> situation. Um, it literally you know, was the season of the witch. Season of the witch, <laughs> because they they shot a movie, they decided to change it to maybe something big, more action, right? That was like the, that was the idea behind it. It was was it horror kind of first, and then they wanted more epicness, or it, it's it's hard to say. <laughs> <laughs> in the beginning, no, no. In the beginning, you know, I think the director had a vision of wanting to do kind of an artistic looking film, right? But obviously. It's about a witch and a demon and all that. So it's it sort of like, you know, it wasn't quite working somehow. It, it just like, it wasn't quite, the tonally wasn't quite right. And I think that sort of the, I don't know, somehow how it transitioned from like this sort of moody, brooding, medieval, yeah. you know, beginning mm -hmm. into a full-blown kind of horror action adventure yeah. just somehow it didn't make the transition properly right so then uh, you know it score it didn't wasn't working so they were like alright let's make it an act make it a horror film and I mean I'd already scored and recorded a lot of the music at that point it's like alright well, let's do that <laughs> so now it's like trying to come up with scares and make it scary yeah through the music um, that didn't work. <laughs> so the decision was to make was made to sort of really go into an action adventure kind of a, a vibe. Mm -hmm. So the whole beginning was rewritten and reshot, and you know I think out of the three season of the witch movies that I scored, <laughs> the last one is by far the best. Right. Know? And I mean it, it made sense, you know. I mean, and do you see that? I mean, were you? Did you know it was bad? Did you know, did you know the third one was coming when you f submitted the horror version? You're like, uh. Oh. Or was it like a like oh god again like? Well, I mean, no, I didn't know. But I mean, when I heard that they were going to do it again, I can't say I was surprised. Right. And I was actually kind of like good. Glad. You know, yeah. Let's let's because uh, it right. I because it's you know, it is really difficult to reinvent movies after they're shot. You know, and it's sort of like it, it's got to be done with care and, and vision well, I and think there's like when people read about that stuff people go like well that's going to be a shit movie now if they have to recut and reshoot like with a I remember there was a big thing with World War Z like they had to reshoot the last 40 minutes or something like that they changed the ending They're like, well it's going to be bad now and then it came out and everyone's like well that's not good but I feel like that's the process of filmmaking is you s see what doesn't work get it out and it's a it's I don't think anyone hits it on the first shot I mean it's rare you yeah. know and I mean I think when you think about the process of making a movie, you know, it's yeah. like somebody gets an idea and you have to write the script and get the cast and get the money and get it all it's to, an and then you're on this. miracle if it's ever, like, to have a finished it, film. It's that is the word that I use. To, <laughs> to just finish a movie is a miracle. Yeah. And let alone make a good movie, yeah. you know, um, which is, you know, it's just, you know, all the more impressive when directors make really great movies you know right and i mean being a part of that kind of a, a you know project where like it works out 
you know, everybody, you know, comes together to make the best they can out of the material. It's really cool. Right. And you were working with uh, it was Dominic uh, Senna on yeah on Seeing the Wish yeah because yeah. you were supposed to do White Out I believe right yes and you got replaced on that one but he came back for you yeah for Season of the Wish yeah so, I mean that that must be cool to have a a director to fight for you kind of like that yeah I'll be honest I think that was more of a coincidence than Dominic oh, really? actually okay. coming after for me to come back okay. you know um, <clears throat> but yeah I mean so many things happen along the way and it's like. Yeah. A lot of it is, most of it is out of the composer's control, you know? I mean, it's I know. Like, That's a lot know. of things. People give a lot of crap to composers that I think they don't realize that it's not up to you, you know, how the scene is or yeah. the film is, and you, you're you're at the service of the producers and the directors. Um, yeah. I mean, that's also, you know, the difference between working in the Hollywood studio system right. and working in independent film, whether it's in Europe or, or here. It's like there's a totally different kind of, a, you know, power structure, I guess, you mm -hmm. know, and there's just fewer people taking, making the decisions. And, uh, you know, so it's like, I mean, you know, filmmaking is about as collaborative as any human endeavor can be, you know, right. it's like you have to work together yeah but there has to be a leader and hopefully a leader with a vision that can carry it through you know right and but it's like you know it's really it's about working with other people isn't it you know yeah, yeah. but uh, but you're right i mean i i sometimes read you know like reviews or comments about somebody's score for this or that and they're like you know missed opportunity or whatever <laughs> yeah. and i'm like you know you weren't there with the with the filmmakers you know right. writing the music and coming up with what's on screen and it's like you know it's uh yeah it's yeah. collaboration <laughs> for sure <laughs> you know um and speaking of collaboration when you work with directors um you know i i come from that kind of side of it what's a what are characteristics you love to see in a director i mean stuff that you talked about having a strong vision do you prefer a director who is kind of gives you a straight kind of guideline to work or do you prefer a director that gets like you know, you I know you and I know your style. Have at it and let me let me see what you come up with. Do you pr prefer more structure, or do you prefer to have kind of like a blank slate to just go crazy with? Um, I think the ideal situation is to have a clean slate musically yeah. to an extent at least, but have a pretty clear vision about what right the function of the music in the film is. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And what it's meant to achieve. You know, and do you have directors that don't communicate that? Have you ever worked? I mean, not just not to say anybody, but have you experienced a bad director that you felt like, well, come on, give me some more guidance here? Uh, I don't feel like I've done that. And I mean, mm -hmm. to be honest, I, I mean, the job is to solve the problem with putting music to this picture. Right. You know? That is my job. <laughs> yeah. You know, and if the director may be out of, you know, um, inexperience or for other reasons doesn't really know what they want then fine you know that's it's my that's my job yeah, to, it's, my, it's the gig you know yeah figure it out you know and i i think that like you know <clears throat> um a director composer relationship is really at the end of the day just the two people who have to get along yeah <laughs> to to figure this out you know and sometimes you know it's like um and I mean, yeah, it's just like with any other situation where two people have to kind of find a way to work together, it's always going to be different based on who these two personalities are. Right, for sure. And, uh, you know, I might be able to have a really good relationship with one director where one of my colleagues, colleagues, you know, wouldn't because it's a personality yeah, thing, you know, a, it really is. It's a relationship, it's a marriage, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. And uh, speaking of directors, you got to work with a pretty well-known auteur director which is James L. Brooks with Edge of mm -hmm. 17 mm -hmm. and how was I mean he, and he's a writer director and I think uh, did you find any difference working with someone who is more really you know there from the script's birth and directing and it's very character based and, uh, and kind of a character study was that how was that working with James who's well known for his films about you know people well first of all I mean the, the movie is really written and directed by Kelly Freeman Craig, you know. Oh, I'm sorry. He produced it. He right? produced oh, it, yeah. you know. <laughs> Having said that, he he was, you know, very involved, and and Kelly is smart enough to know, you know, it's really a good idea 
to have Jim on board and learn right. from a master right, right. like him because that he truly is a master he's yeah. just like he's an incredible mind incredible filmmaker an incredible human being so I mean I don't know I as I said you know she she did a magnificent job writing coming up with that story and, and right. directing but she also did a brilliant job by accepting and being open to having somebody like him next to her. Right, know? for sure. So that was that was a great experience. I mean, I came in on very late on that. Yeah. And, um, you know, Hans was involved as well as a sort of producer of the music. And, and, you know, I mean, we would be sitting here in this room at 3 in the morning jamming some craziness <laughs> on the guitar. And it's like, it was it was a lot like the old days, just being in a band, you know. Yeah. And... Um, that was, it was great. That oh, was such yeah, a fun, like an awesome experience. It really was. It was. <laughs> it was one of the better ones. Um, so we we talked about at the be- you know you started your career working with Mike Post, and then now you kind of developed your own kind of filmography of, um, I guess what he's known for is kind of the the dramatic procedurals and and stuff like that. And you've had some, you know, you did Law and Order LA, and you're doing the Law and Order uh, miniseries. But I mean. And you got really involved in Chicago, Chicago Med, Chicago Justice, Chicago Fire, Chicago PD. I mean, you might, you're a native of Chicago. <laughs> well, I, I guess they had they figured they needed somebody who, who was used to being cold. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so when you were working with that many titled shows with Chicago in the title, um, you know, the city is obviously an important place in all those series. Um, what's the diff- What separates them all apart for you to where you found a musical voice for each one or did you kind of look at them and kind of maybe create a similar sounding universe between them or was it well it's sort of organically just grown the 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 chicago universe i mean it just started with fire right and uh i mean you know it's a movie about firefighters obviously Mm -hmm. uh and you know i was inspired by something that dick wolf said about you know people like that you know first respondents you know like people who just completely sacrifice themselves yeah. to help other people you know i mean it's something extraordinary about that you know and then i mean when i went back into sort of thinking about musically like i mean it's obviously it's the heartland of america it's americana yeah and sure. you know and and there's a strong sort of Irish tradition in f- mm. in fire departments on the East Coast and the Midwest, at least. And yeah. uh, so in my first suite, there was quite a bit of sort of an Irishness to it, which, you know, has arguably watered down, da- has been watered down a bit. <laughs> but I think there might still be a, a nucleus of that in there somewhere. Yeah. Maybe, I don't know, maybe not Irish, but, you know, something that's sort of like... Um, slightly sort of celtic slash americana kind of a a sound you know but then i mean so okay then pd comes along and now that's totally different you know and it's a different world it's much much harder Mm -hmm. tougher world for detectives that are you know i mean chicago is a rough town you know right and um so but it still seemed like it should be of the same family yeah just harder edge yeah yeah you know then med came along and now we're getting into sort of a much more sort of a cerebral kind of a world you know Mm -hmm. i mean you know people are trying to save people's lives on the on the uh the operating rooms and all these things i mean that's like a you know that was kind of the the mo for that was like let's try to get into these people's brains and, and be procedural with them in that sense but then there's also kind of a there's a lot of drama and and you know i mean i've had a child who was very sick and you just realize that like you know hospitals are you know just rife with people in you know in sort of moments in their lives mm-hmm. that are maybe the, the most difficult moments of their lives you yeah, know for sure. so there's so much drama yeah. <laughs> going on in any given hospital at any given time yeah. That 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 you know, kind of was a sort of a deep vein for me to go into, and and some of the music that I enjoy the most that I've written for, uh, for the Chicago series come out of that space, you know, yeah. because I feel like it's just like, that's where people's lives are on the line, you know. Yeah, there's I mean, a lot of humanity there. Yeah. And families and families are you know, 
are affected and it's a big big deal for people you know right and um yeah, so that's, uh, <laughs> I mean, it just grew, We, you yeah. know, and then Justice came along for a few months uh, right. last season and was canceled, uh, unfortunately, because mm. I, I thought it was a good show and it was doing quite well, so it was surprising. But um, but that was, you know, I mean, this is the, we're talking about the production company that created Law & Order. Yes, yeah. I mean, they know how to do a procedural oh, show about law. Yeah. So, I mean, <laughs> I, I like, that just felt like it just, from episode one, it was like knew what it wanted to be. And, yeah, that's, you know. So yeah, there was a really strong vision, which is yeah, easy, makes it easier for you. I can say. Yeah, <laughs> I think so. I mean, I didn't want to go back to Law and Order, but right. but still, it's all like, I mean, there is something. There's like a DNA. Yeah, in, in all of it, right? That, for it, sure, that connects together. I mean, we're talking about the kind of the balance of uh, you doing studio pictures <clears throat> and kind of smaller independent pictures, and you did a few that I really really loved, which was a single shot, a uh, Colette. Um, these kind of really smaller films that in the single shot I really um, gravitated towards because it was like that was a short film pretty much I made similar really? <laughs> in college the same plot and everything right. I love characters like out of the element of like societal structure and just kind of you know with moral really deep moral choices and mm -hmm. ethics and stuff you know um, is that fun for you as a composer to kind of break down the psychology of a character and try to flesh it out musically i mean yeah. you guys are psychologists i think in a, yeah. in a way yeah i think we are yeah you know <clears throat> on different levels because right. obviously we're psychological manipulators with the music right. then there's the psychology of working with the directors and the filmmakers yeah you have to be a therapist for that <laughs> yeah and, and but you also have to be your character's <laughs> therapist in a way yeah you know or, or try to get into their heads i mean that movie is really about a guy who just you know you know makes a morally you know flawed decision yeah and everything just falls apart right you know yeah and i mean i i feel like that's really what that story is about you know so <clears throat> and i mean i think that it was like cook sort of the deconstruction of his fragile you know existence mm -hmm. and it just all goes bad you yeah know? and i mean that was kind of the the uh arc of the music as well you know uh, but that film, I mean, the director of that film, David Rosenthal, is a, is, has become a good friend of mine. Mm -hmm. We've collaborated now on, on two, three, two and a half films because we're halfway through one and right. he's already shooting the next one. Oh, wow. How <laughs> it ends, which I think is going to be a really fun project. That's it's awesome. sort of a post apocalyptic thriller. But, you know, David is, I've been really lucky with directors that I work with because right, yeah. a lot of them are really. They just love music, yeah. you know, and David keeps educating me about music, you know. Right. Like, he'll send me podcasts and playlists and stuff. I'm like, wow, this is really cool stuff. Where do you <laughs> find this, you know? He just loves, you know, kind of modern, sort of neoclassical, off the beaten path yeah. stuff. And, and for a single shot, it was kind of a... a you know, <clears throat> like an education in in sort of aleatoric, atonal yeah, music. For sure. You know, and it, I mean, for me, it's like you know, being a film composer is like an endless exploration of music. Yeah. You yeah, know, and yeah. it's like in that particular instance, I got to just go deep into Penderecki and this guy Skelchi. It was like an Italian composer. That I, nobody's heard about it except for David <laughs> Rosenthal. <laughs> and we started listening to that stuff, and it's so out there, and it's from the early 1900s. Oh, wow. And, uh, you know, um, so anyway, I mean, again, like a new exploration, you know. I yeah. mean, it's like, it's not the accordion in a church in a valley in Iceland, but yeah. it's something else. But, but you have to go in and learn how to do it, you know. Yeah. And, and that's the thrill of it. And, I mean... You know, I feel like I learned some tricks and I made up my own tricks mm -hmm. along the way. I've probably forgotten all of them now, right. but it doesn't really matter. It was just like being in that situation at the time and trying to tell the story through David's eyes, through the music that we felt was representing, you know, the psychology of this poor man who was <laughs> <laughs> who was about to get killed. You yeah, know? exactly. You know. Um and we've talked about so many different genres that you've done. Um, is there any genre that you find more challenging than the other to crack? Like maybe a comedy versus a horror versus action. Is there one that throws you more of a challenge as a, as a storyteller? 
I think I find action the hardest. Yeah. You know, uh-huh. I, I, I think it's like, um, I don't know if it's like ADD or something, but I, I find it hard to have the patience to yeah. do it. And it, but it's at the same time, when you sit down and really do it, it's amazingly fun once you get it right. You right. know, uh, for me, I mean, like writing a tune usually comes pretty easy to me, mm-hmm. you know, and, um, I mean, comedy is really difficult. Yeah. But I think I have a knack for it. I think I have a, you know, some. I, it's not. Uh, I don't know. I'm afraid to say something that's going to come back to haunt me later. But <laughs> but you know, it's so, yeah, like we can cut it out of. His yeah, yeah, head. yeah. You promised to cut it out. It was really bad. Uh, <laughs> no, but I think it's not. I, I think yeah. It's like it's something that is not quite as difficult for me as a lot of composers. It's, right. You know, because funny music is, I mean, it's like... Well, comedy is so hard because of, I think, just gra- grabbing the tone. And I know a lot of composers, you know, I talk with Chris Leonard, who does a lot of comedies. Yeah. And, and and then you look at the older stuff that I love, you know, like Airplane and like satire comedies or going back to Charlie Chaplin. And, yeah. And the comedy is always on the screen. It's always there. The char- The actors are the ones who are being funny, but it's very hard to know what the music's role is supposed yeah. to be. Yeah. And a lot of those movies are scored extremely serious. Yeah, you know, exactly. This is like that's why the, the satire ones are the I think the easiest ones because it's like oh just look at this is a comedy make it serious you yeah, know like Naked yeah, Gun or even yeah. Tropic Thunder. Yeah. You know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I think when I was starting out, I I always felt like comedy probably has to be in a major key, uh-huh. but it's actually way more successful in a minor key uh-huh. because then there's a bit of a you know there's a bit of a wink there's a bit of sort of uh cheekiness to it yeah. you know and i mean you know one observation that i've made is that you know making let's say like horror f- music even there seems to be a lot more to experiment with and discover in the dark realm yeah <laughs> than right. in in upbeat you know i mean you have the pizzicato strings and the out of tune piano and the, the accordion, you know, and it's like, I mean, there aren't that many sort of new ways of making comedy. And, right. And, and well, I you did the fourth kind. That was a horror film that I thought was different. I, yeah. Yeah. You didn't go with the, the stereotypical thing. I remember a lot of kind of insect sounds. I'm trying to remember. It's been yeah. Since I listened, but it was yeah. very different to me. No, I, I really, you know, went out. Again, I was just trying to yeah. get out of my. It's a combination of just like you know, self-preservation and try to do <laughs> something to figure it out, right. and also try to like actively, you know, sort of push your own boundaries. And yeah. Try to come up with something new. Right. For sure. Um, let's see. So. I did want to talk about a little bit about another film I like was Hansel and Gretel Witch Hunters. You had to revisit mm. the witch world. <laughs> and there yeah. was there was a period in Hollywood where they were making kind of these dark versions of the fairy tales and it, you know there was I think a Red Riding Hood one and um I mean that must have been a fun thing to f- take a well-known story and flip it on its head a little bit and then yeah. And I remember, I, was at, I think I was at the premiere with you at the at the Chinese Yeah. Theater. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, um you know, uh, another director who really loves music, Tommy Rokola, yeah, <laughs> from Norway, and you know we're both Scandinavians, and you know in, in Europe it's interesting with with um, Europeans, our sort of fairy tales, and you know lullabies, bedtime stories yeah. are really dark and scary. <laughs> yeah. You know, well, I have a Polish mother. Yeah, and it's I like mean it's just like like terrifying <laughs> stuff. You know, I mean. And I, 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 you know... It's only America where it's like fairies and bright and Disney. Yeah, you know, I mean, you know, I have a five-year-old daughter and she still crawls into bed almost every night. It's probably because we're telling her horrible (laughs) stories every night. No, but uh, but seriously speaking, I mean, it's like... It is an interesting, you know, observation, I think, that it's just like... We're just darker over there, you know? And, And I think it comes through in, like, the way... Tommy is sort of like his, you know, Dead Snow, the movie he did before this, yeah. is, is hilarious. It, it's so, I mean, it's so over the top, dark and gory, and, and <laughs> yeah. that it's just like, it's it's hilarious. But but he has that sort of, you know, um, I mean, his sense of humor is, is very sort of, is naughty, you know, it's like, yeah. it's, and so when he 
wrote the script. I mean, I think that the premise is great, you know. Yeah. It's like, uh, and, but coming up with the music was very interesting because, I mean, first meeting I had with him, he's like, I want the music to sound like Metallica. <laughs> I'm like, okay. <laughs> uh, and then, you know, I talked to someone from the studio and they were like, no, 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 no. It's like, it should definitely, or the producers or somebody else. Yeah. Because it, it was like, there was a lot of chefs in the kitchen on that yeah, one. Yeah, for sure. And they were like, no, it needs to be more like classical and, and almost Baroque, you know, and like, and then the studio probably was like, no, dubstep, man. That's, that's where it's at. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I think. I love how that's the studio. <laughs> but, you know, I think actually this was a really good thing, uh -huh. you know, because I, I feel like if you listen to the main title, The Witch Hunter's Theme. It's got all these elements in there, you know. <laughs> There's like sort of big guitar walls, Metallica style. There's some, you know, glitchy dubstep drum programming. Yeah. There's kind of like this sort of gothic sounding, you right. know, Baroque-ish <laughs> choir. And I mean, I never would have thought of putting that piece of music together if I hadn't been forced to do it. Yeah, wow, okay. You know what I mean? That's it, yeah, So I, th sure. I think that's the silver lining is that it's like, that, Yeah, you, you know, you're under the direction, but you're pushed into a place where you never would have thought to go. Yeah, and one would never go in the, in the right mind, <laughs> you know? A Baroque metallic dubstep <laughs> yeah. piece. Yeah, no, I mean, who would, <laughs> like, that's crazy. But, but because it's crazy, I think it's actually turned out pretty cool. Yeah, it was a fun score. I really enjoyed that one. <laughs> and the movie was great, too. It yeah, was, yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun. It was fun. Um, so we were talking about the, kind of the difficulty of uh, action genre, and then you talk about comedy, and then we have an action comedy right now, your recent score, Hitman's Bodyguard. Yeah. Um, so, and we were talking about, you know, you were talking about bringing in blues and different kind of genres from your past, and... What was the goal? What was the approach for this one? Because you want to make it fun. You want to make it, and I feel like action comedy, you have to get the tone right musically. So, yeah. Kind of what were those discussions about the music here, and what did you want the score to do? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, again, sitting in this room with Patrick Hughes yeah. and talking about it, and just like, it was actually uh, after the Super Bowl. It was like the night after the last Super Bowl. Uh -huh. You know, he com came over with a bottle of wine. And his playlist on his iPhone, and we sat and drank wine and listened to blues mostly, but like whatever music he had been listening to while shooting the film. Right. And, you know, another director who just loves music. And, you know, he uh, had basically picked out most of the songs that were going to be in the film. And, I mean, it's in his head already when he's working out the scene and, and rewriting the script and all that stuff. It's all like, it's all in his master plan. Right. Uh, <clears throat> I think his thing was I, I don't want a generic you know sounding score right. I don't want the, the typical action music score you know and uh, so I felt that my job was to try to honor all this great blues and rock and roll stuff that he had been listening yeah, to yeah. and try to somehow you know do a rock and roll score yeah that was the that was the job in my opinion you know and uh and yeah it, i mean it was just so much fun because you know he really fought very hard for that direction you know and yeah. i mean the studio kind of wanted to reel us in a little bit uh -huh. and he just wouldn't give up you know and That's uh great. and the other thing about you know what i think is great about patrick and and his approach to the the film is that he, you know, he, like there's some, you know, sort of tender moments and in those moments he wanted really sort of genuine down to earth music. He didn't want, you know, like the love theme to be too over the top. He just wanted right. almost like, so I, I think the, the, the threat that goes through the score is kind of an exploration or, or an attempt to just be sort of rootsy and just be like yeah. you know honest and just like sitting at the piano and like playing a tune you know right. and, <laughs> rather than putting on your composer cap and like start writing some string lines you know yeah, yeah. I mean I think that and I, I think what makes the film unique in a way is that there's a lot of moments that are just kind of I don't want to get too over dramatic but real yeah. You know, and it's like in the music organic kind of organic Yeah, yeah, emotions. exactly. Yeah. You know, and it's unusual in a film like this. Yeah. Nowadays, I think it was more sort of typical maybe in the 90s or something like yeah. that, you know, for some of those sort of buddy action movies 
Yeah, of that time. The weapon had a lot of real moments. I remember it being a funny yeah. action movie. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's a suicide scene. He almost kills himself. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. You don't see that these days. Right? No, you don't. Yeah. You don't. Not really. So, so I, I think what makes that work, what makes the film really work, is that sort of juxtaposition. You know, right? It's ridiculously over the top right. and funny at times, and then there are other moments. I mean, the, it's really a love story. Uh huh. You yeah. know, it's really about you know Ryan Reynolds' character trying to get together with his old girlfriend yeah and you know sam jackson and salma hayek getting together right. again you know and it is like i mean you know that's <laughs> that's the <laughs> that's the real story there you yeah, know for sure you know that's what you focused on yeah it's and it's such a fun score and you got what, two weekends in a row number one so congrats yeah, yeah thanks yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. for sure no, it's great it's great um so yeah people are loving it i'm you know, a lot of work great word of mouth <clears throat> yeah um, you know i mean it's just one of those films that is like it's it's funny. It's yeah. hilarious, yeah. and it's not meant to be looked at as great art because yeah. it isn't. It's yeah. it's there for people to have fun. Right. Exactly. And I think I think it does the job. <laughs> sure. And I think right now in this political climate, that's what we people need. need yeah. You know, because there's it. a lot of you know, it's very tense around here. So you know, <laughs> a little bit of laughing is good right yeah, now. Yeah, but you're gonna you're gonna skedaddle in a few days. <laughs> yeah, I, I go back and forth. You know. Yeah, I want to talk about that because you do you split your time between here and Iceland right now. Yeah, right? yeah. Were you because were you fully located here in LA a while ago and then you decided to move back to Iceland? Was that the decision? Yeah, that was sort of the, yeah, I mean, I lived here for 18 years. Right. You know, and, um, and, uh, so is your family and you're, you're based on out, out of, they're living out of Iceland and you come here to work? Is that kind of the, yeah, that's yeah, sort yeah. of the, that, that's sort of the deal right now. No, I mean, you know, it was really my wife and I wanted our kids to know our family. Yeah. You know, I mean, it wasn't really much more complicated than that. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, we we used to go there every summer, you know, for a few weeks just right. to kind of try to maintain some sort of a relationship connection. and stuff like that and connection. And, uh, and then actually the year uh, Rams won the Uncertain Regard Prize at Cannes, you know, we went, took the kids out of school early, went to Iceland, and mm -hmm. and my wife, who is from America, from Virginia, actually, oh, wow. uh, she just started falling in love with Iceland, <laughs> you yeah. know. And, and so uh, we go, so yeah, it's June. I had to come back here for work to write the score for Bilal uh -huh. or work on that. Yeah. And, and when I come back at the end of June, early July, she's like, you know what, I'm not going back. Wow. And I'm just like, are you sure? <laughs> you know, yeah. might want to think about this. You know, yeah. you haven't been through a winter here. <laughs> it's known as Iceland. <laughs> yeah, it, there's the a name. reason they call it Iceland. You know, and I mean, I was concerned about like my career and everything, and yeah. And, but you know, the funny thing is, it's actually my career has really gotten better, I if guess, anything. Yeah. And I think a part of it is. I needed to go home to connect with my roots and write music for right. tiny little European films yeah, for sure. where I could just write something honest, you know? Yeah. Because at the end of the day, even though, you know, there's a lot of chefs in the kitchen sometimes and it's, it's, it's like big productions, what what people want from a composer is feeling, is like yeah. it's emotion. emotion. It's like, it's yeah. that's what we bring to the table, you know? So being able to go and do like a collette or do you know, um, pound for pound, this Danish movie I just did, right. which, you know, um, y y you just get to write different yeah. kinds of music. And I, I mean, I hope I'll, I'll get to sort of split my time between here and there, f you know, as long as I can write music. Yeah. Because, because I love doing both, and each world, you know, sort of informs the other, you know. Yeah, for sure. And I think it's a really good, good thing. You yeah. Know? Well, I'm glad you found that balance. I think it, it's amazing and yeah. for your family and for your career. And I think that's incredible to find that very lucky. And, and I just want to thank you, Atlee, for, uh, for your time here tonight and, and just sitting down. And, and uh, it's been such a great pleasure to chat. Yeah, man. So much fun. <laughs> and uh, best of luck. And I and, uh, hope we do it again sometime. Yeah, it'll be great. <laughs> Thanks, man.